Hello and welcome to Schumacher College, um, where as, as part of this year's Disruptive Innovation Festival, um, asking the question, what if we could redesign everything, um, we're going to share our thoughts about that with you this afternoon, um, based around our belief that if we are to redesign everything, the key to that lies with a return to making. Um, I'm going to introduce um, our um, fellow guests this afternoon. Um, to my left is Michael Martin, who is Hello. a designer and maker, who believes that redesigning everything must re be, um, begin with a return to making because the process of making transforms the process of design. Um, then also joined by Kate Mo Bowman, who is a designer, a maker, a potter and a trickster and she believes that a return to making and the process of making transforms community. Um, my name is Ruth Potts, I'm a um, senior lecturer in ecological design thinking here at Schumacher College and I'm also the co-author with my um, friend and colleague Andrew Sims of a pamphlet called The New Materialism and in that I set out our ideas about the way in which a return to making can reduce resource consumption, um, increase well-being and revive hollowed out local economies and communities. Um, so what we're going to do this afternoon is we'll each um, say a little bit about why it is that we think what we think um, and then we'll have um, a little bit of a conversation and hopefully um, many, of our, many of you will respond um, to this film online and continue that conversation. And one of the things, given that our proposition is that redesigning everything begins with making, um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about objects um, that have particular meaning and value to us and to the subject that we're exploring together. Um, so I'm going to ask um, or invite Michael to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, OK, I have uh, brought with me um, three objects um, I have made. Um, and one object um, uh, that in inspired um, this whole process and inquiry. Um, so um, I'll start with the object um, that this um, began with, and um, uh, this is just a ordinary um, uh, mass-produced uh, um, uh, household cup um, that is um, uh, produced on an industrial scale um, and uh, never actually um, uh, touches a human hand until um, we purchase it um, in the store. Um, so the reason why I'm starting with this is um, uh, while I was here uh, studying um, at Schumacher College I became interested in in how um, the things that we surround ourselves with um, express um, uh, our value systems um, and our beliefs and ultimately our world view and so I noticed that there was an incongruence between um, the, the, the thing I was actually coming into contact every day and drinking uh, my tea and coffee from and the things I was learning um, here at Schumacher about um, sustainability and ecological design in particular and so that really then um, started a much longer and deeper inquiry into um, the relationship between design thinking, um, the things that we make, um, and how um, the separation of those things um, has um, created um, uh, the, the part of the crises that we, we find ourselves in now. So, um, so for me, this mug um, kind of expressed um, uh, how our, our modern society uh, and how that industrialized uh, world view. So for me this becomes like a microcosm of that macrocosm. So um, that led me to um, think about, well if I wanted to um, 
uh, to change, make a change in society, to make a change in the world, how could I do that through making? Um, so I designed an experiment just to test out some of my ideas and um, so I have three items here. Um, the, the first one is made by hand, well they're all actually made by hand, but this one in particular um, I guess you could say is a, an improvement from the industrial um, uh, process to a sort of a small scale, um, small, small scale handmade um, production. So if I wanted to, um, as a maker, um, uh, try and move away from consuming um, uh, an item like this, for which you can buy in the shops for three or four pounds, um, you know, how, how could I um, move towards a more socially uh, responsible uh, response, like design solution, and so this really is a is a um, a way of testing that as an idea. So I um, purchased the clay um, uh, online, so it's delivered within forty eight hours. I then um, I then made this by hand on an electric machine, uh, an electric wheel, and then it was fired in an electric kiln. So in terms of its um, ecological footprint is actually quite high um, but it's in terms of how that made me feel in, in the making process it made me feel um, a lot better than buying that in the supermarket mm -hmm. you know so for me that it, it, that was an improvement on, on on this piece but so then the second piece here um, is a more ecological response. So I went from, uh, instead of consuming the clay, actually buying it online, I sourced the clay locally. So I went and uh, found a place on the estate where Schumacher College is and um, dug the clay myself. Um, and from the, the time that I actually harvested the clay, um, it took about a week to process that and make it ready to actually um, uh, to work with on the wheel. Um, so this, actually, this, this was thrown on the wheel, but it was actually thrown on a kick wheel. So this was, again, um, uh, a sort of a more ecological uh, version of this. So it was powered um, by, by my energy. Um, and then it was fired in a wood-fired kiln. So, um, and so I became interested in um, my relationship to these objects as well, and you know how how my relationship to this object actually deepened because of the time that I was spending uh, with the material in the making process. Um, and you can see that it's gone a bit wobbly, <laughs> but I think that adds sort of some character to it as well. But um, so I felt that actually. In terms of um, ecological design, this was a more ecological design solution to to this. Um, and then, um, and then I asked, well, is there another way? So, putting aside machines altogether and just um, uh, using my hands, and um, and so this version here um, is with the same clay that I used for this pot. But um, I added um, a sand, um, a very fine sand, to, to make the clay more, um, to improve its structure um, so that I could actually work with it because I've, what I found was with this clay in particular it was very plastic. Um, so, um, so this was made in a day, um, this was made over the course of a week. And as you can see, the shape is is um, uh, much more circular because actually, what what it's based on is 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 my hand and you know the relationship, um, how I use my fingers to shape the clay. So, so I, I I you know I became interested in well, you know, I would never actually have sat down and designed that um, as a as an object that that design came about through the process of the making and my relationship 
uh, with that material. And um, so for me, this, this is the beginning of a much deeper and longer inquiry into how the making process actually really transforms uh, the design process. And if indeed um, we do want to create a new um, uh, world, we can start on a very small scale with the things mm -hmm. that we make. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michael. And um, Kate, let's hear a bit from, from your perspective. Yes, so the object that I've brought is this quite small, unfinished cup. Um, and I wanted to talk about communities making. And I wanted to talk about it through Donna Haraway's sense of sympoesis, making with and this idea of what happens when communities make things together. Mm. What, what does that do? Um, and I got quite excited about the idea of how when communities make things to together, it creates connections, it creates these webs, these kind of complex webs, where people come into relation with place. Mm -hmm. They are literally holding the place in their hands and it's getting under their fingertips, it's getting kind of under their fingernails. They also tend to be making in that kind of scenario where they've dug the clay themselves mm. outside in a field, in a forest, somewhere like that. So you're actually really feeling the place that mm. you're making with. Um, also the sense of people connecting to each other. Yeah. For this, I really like the idea of the trickster. Um, and I reframe the role of the facilitator, the kind of convener of the, the workshop, the, the person holding the space for the making, as this trickster, as this crosser of boundaries, this person that will, that will gently pull and push a community through the boundaries into spaces of possibility. And through looking at that, actually really found in my own practice that, one, that when a trickster was holding that, that space, that members of the community slowly took on that role for each other, mm -hmm. that they, they began um, doing that, that kind of like push and pull over mm -hmm. boundaries with each other, mm -hmm. and, and that actually the facilitator could, could step back. Um, and also the connections with matter. Mm -hmm. This idea of coming into relationship with matter and through working with something like clay in the clay workshops that I did over the course of the summer, communities would become like the matter. Mm. They would begin to think flexibly. They would begin to see around problems. They would begin to see the failure, the kind of crumbling of a pot as a success in some kind of way. And this also really linked into this idea of a clay cycle for me of encouraging and working with the community to dig the clay mm. themselves, to actually crumble it up with their hands, to be treading it with their feet, mm. to be kneading it with their fingers, and then to make pots individually and together. Huge pots that ended up being um, rock concert stadiums or alligators or absolutely as, as kind of anything as far as the imagination could stretch. And that that in, in doing that, um, people, and, and then, sorry, after doing that, the pots would be, would be taken to a place of their choosing. So it could be under a tree, next to a river, under a bush, and that, that this kind of completion of the cycle where a community had witnessed from the digging of the clay to processing it, to working it with, to pots and then putting it back in the ground, gave a sense of, of being part of something bigger, gave both a connection to place and also a connection to the complex webs in which we all sit, in mm. which we are all part of. Um, and tied into that was the idea of something not being completed. I've brought an unfired pot that could yeah. easily go, I could leave it outside, Lovely. I could kind of smush it back into the bag of clay. And it was this, this idea of, of this, this space of possibility that you open up either individually as a workshop convener, as a trickster, mm. or as a community that you open up. And how suddenly when you have these spaces of possibility, this, this room to maneuver, this mm. sense of hope, that, that completely unexpected things can happen. Mm. And for me, with the, with the kind of the extra link for the, the community making with was the sense of, of how do you keep open that moment of making? Mm. How do you, do you expand that? And, 
and I worked with that through through not firing things, mm -hmm. through through keeping them as, as unfinished as possible. So that is why I have an unfinished pot. Lovely, thank you. Lovely, <laughs> thanks, Kate. Um, so I'm I'm gonna just yeah say a, a few things, and then I've got questions for for both of you. Um, so the the object that I have is a um, a cup that was made here on the Dartington estate at the Studio 45 Pottery and I suppose my interest in the idea of a new materialism, a transformed relationship with the material world that we're part of is how that can help reduce our impact on the environment and um, so how a return to making can help us live within ecological limits, how it connects us to the material world that we're part of, um, and how it has the potential, I think, to revive our economies in meaningful ways and pr by providing um, ample quality employment. Um, and I think this cup is, is really interesting in the way that mm -hmm. it shows how yeah it shows how there is employment potential in making and this is part of the studio 45's pottery's apprentice range mm -hmm. um, where apprentices are make things according to a preset pattern and they use both the mark of the pottery mm -hmm. but also their own mark um, and it's a way in which they're they're trained and can then go on to establish their own mark. And there are a huge range of uh, interesting innovations around um, around ceramics. Like Kate introduced me to the idea of a community-supported pottery, um, where ceramics like this, which are more expensive than mm -hmm. mass-produced, are made accessible mm -hmm. through a scheme um, through a scheme whereby people pay an annual instalment and then a crockery set is delivered to them in parts throughout the week, the year. So ways in which um, communities can be reconnected with the makers through that process of support um, but also spreading out the payments so that the maker knows that they will be paid for the objects but the person who's buying them is able to spread out the payments over the course of the year <coughs> to receive the material gradually. Um, but to get a bit deeper into that idea of the new materialism, what I was interested in was um, the way in which materialism in the modern world has become synonymous with com consumerism. So it's um, it's sort of it's debt fueled. We go into debt to, to buy more to to achieve satisfaction. It's ecologically destructive because of the material throughput of the economy and the velocity by which we consume. And it's fundamentally unsatisfying. And we're constantly <coughs> chasing more. And, and yet whenever we get a thing, we're told that we should be buying the next thing. Yeah. Um, but given that we are, we're part of a material world, I was interested in exploring whether it's not that we've been looking in the wrong place for happiness, mm -hmm. but we've got the relationship um, badly wrong. And as I as I began to explore this idea, um, I came across kind of the, the evidence of the sort of the transformative potential of transforming our relationship with the material and what it is that we understand when we come into the relationship with the material. So I found examples like um, the historian of metals, um, Cyril Smith, shows that it wasn't scientists who first understood the polycrystalline structure of metals, it was makers. Mm -hmm. Because they, through making, they understood where the weaknesses in the, in the material was, where this, what the structure must be in order for the material to act in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something profound that we understand about give and take, um, and about the structure of of the world through engagement with making. Um, the stonemason leader Kindersley um, puts it beautifully as well about the way in which making teaches us about limits. 
So she, when she has apprentice stonemasons, the first thing that she gets them to do is she gets a really, really sharp pencil and she gets them to draw out the letters that they're going to carve in stone. And the point with doing that is that if they force the point of the pencil, the pencil breaks. Mm -hmm. So they learn about how to work with the material and about how to use force to shape yeah. rather than to impose, um, impose shape on an object. There are, are other ways in which I think the process of making is transformative. So um, my colleague here at Schumacher, Mona Nasseri, explored the way in which through engagement with the materials, the maker themselves are transformed because the, the process of making is a process of constant give and take and learning. So through the process of making, the maker makes themselves. And there are kind of there are other fascinating examples, like another colleague, Seaton Baxter, working with colleagues at the University of Dundee, um, got two groups, one group to prototype in two dimensions, so through flat through drawing through flat design, and another group to prototype in three dimensions, so using material making form. And what he found was not only did the group who were making in three dimensions um, come up with more uh, imaginative solutions to the problems they've been set, yeah. but it also created better teams. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the way in which actually the process of making um, teaches us something fundamental, cultivates um, imagination, and it makes connections um, between us with the material world and, and yeah, and with, and it makes, making, I think, mm. makes community. So I think what that points to me, kind of economically and in terms of the potential for transformation, um, it points to a, a culture of, of making, mm. mending, and um, reimagining. And I think, uh, I think it's a, it's a, a, um, a, a, potential, a potential to replace a kind of passive, disengaged, throwaway consumer culture mm. um, with a culture where um, far more of us know ourselves mm. how to do everything from kind of stitching clothing to painting a wall to throwing a pot. Mm. Um, and I think, as, as you've both been exploring, mm. that, um, that uh, cultivates our imagination it makes us more adaptable to changing circumstances um, and it reconnects us to, to one another and to place. So actually in that, in that, um, from that perspective, a return to making or a culture where more of us make is, um, is a culture and an economy that is, um, that is more engaged, more dynamic, richer, um, enhances our well-being rather than destroying it. And I think what's really interesting is is the way in which we can see that beginning to emerge already. So I think there are um, ways in which the things that the we the way that we see this reflected back through popular culture is I think that programs like and the popularity of programs like the Great British Bake Off yeah. or the Sewing Bee, I don't think those are leading. Mm -hmm. Um, the zeitgeist. I think they're following the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. and I think they're tapping into yeah. something quite fundamental that's happening. And I think you can look at, for example, the rise of hack spaces and maker spaces, mm -hmm. and the ways in which people are coming together yeah. to create spaces in which things can be made. Um, there's a place called um, Building Block in Edmonton, in, in London, for example, mm -hmm. um, which has created a space in which people can. Um, small makers can come together to fabricate, to produce locally, and I think, mm -hmm. um, I think that shift has to be at the heart of um, more interesting, ecological, ecologically sustainable communities and economies. You can see, uh, oh, there are so many things from <laughs> growing <laughs> projects to furniture recycling projects yeah. that provide affordable quality furniture for people on low incomes that are also training people um, in uh, who are not in education and training in skills that will mm. skills that can't be taken away from them skills that will take them through life and enable them to engage and work mm. in meaningful ways so I think um, I think the the really by putting making back into the heart of the economy I mm. think we see a future in which 
uh, sort of in which it, it's an economy of not of bigger but of better. Mm. It's an economy that is richer, more imaginative, more creative, and more interesting. Um, <laughs> which is what excites me about all of this. Um, and uh, I just kind of picking up on a couple mm-hmm. of things that you both said, I just mm-hmm. wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions um, that relate back to, um, to this, this question at the heart of the Disruptive Innovation Festival, mm-hmm. what if we could redesign everything? Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted to ask you, Michael, mm-hmm. whether um, you think Actually, if we, if because I'm really interested in, in uh, what you, what you say about the way in which engagement with making transforms the process of design, and I'm interested in whether you think mm. if we're going to move towards um, a more ecologically sustainable and socially just world, yeah. whether actually we should be putting making at the heart of the design curriculum. Absolutely, I, I, I think I don't think we 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 can think our way to that um, to that end point. Um, I think we're going to have to make our way there, mm-hmm. and um, which is ironic, seeing as I've just done a master's in ecological design thinking. But actually, I I believe that I had to go through that um, in order to realise um, um, that um, I I needed to reconnect with the making process. So I do believe that making needs to be brought into the heart of, um, back into the heart of design, um, education. And, um, and actually we need to re, re, reimagine um, design education. Um, and, you know, I think that will begin here mm. at Schumacher College, I really do. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, um, Making needs needs to be at the heart of it, yeah. Um, that's just a very short answer, but, <laughs> yeah. but I do. I yeah. yeah. I, uh, I'm convinced of it. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. And um, and Kate, kind of picking up on on what you said, which is uh, just kind of beautiful and extraordinary and exciting. I'm interested in kind of in the times that we're living in, in mm. terms of yeah, in terms of meeting a range of social and ecological challenges. Um, it seems to me that, that one of the key factors that we need to cultivate is um, adaptability mm-hmm. and imagination. And I just wondered when you were when you were talking it, what really came across was that what you were cultivating or what, what it seemed you what it seemed that you were cultivating through making with community mm. was connections mm. and imagination and I wondered if you could say in terms of what if we could redesign everything um, what can we what could we do what what should we be doing to to, to cultivate that through cultures of making mm. um, I guess for me it would be that it would be that making almost acts as a convener of people, yeah. that it that it is allowed to be something that we kind of unashamedly use to bring people together. Mm-hmm. It's something that we use to have conversations. It is a way that we um, can dialogue with each other, with a place that we can solve problems, um, and that then once that once that culture of, of making being as every day mm-hmm. as kind of getting out a flip chart, that. That just the sense of imagination of this these spaces of possibility arise, mm. because rather than just having having a dialogue between two people or between a room full of people, mm. you almost have this other in the middle of the room, mm. which is what you're making together, mm. and it is both completely all of you and your fingerprints were all over it and it has also nothing to do with any of you mm. and it is something that you can kind of look at and go really is that is that what we think or is that how we're going to do this mm-hmm. um and it just it really really making really allows things to be to be reframed and to suddenly to shift the frame mm. to be able to say in a discussion or in a community actually let's look over here mm. um and for me that would be that would be how we could we could redesign things is by putting that at the center it suddenly the conversations are different yeah. mm. so should we have maker spaces on every high street yes and making in schools yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, absolutely yeah 
So um, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for watching. Um, there is space um, space to respond in the comments online, um, and we will be dipping back in. We'd love to hear from you, um, and we'd love to hear um, more ideas about how we can put making back into design, back into our communities, um, and back into our local economies. Um, and we'd like to hear your thoughts and opinions, um, and we'll share more of ours as well. So thank you, and thank you to the Disruptive Innovation Festival for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.